we're in for a long one. A long weekend, that is. And you deserve to spend it on the couch with a glass of something good. Luckily, there's Drizzly, the number one app for alcohol delivery. With Drizzly, you can compare prices on the biggest selection of beer, wine, and spirits. Then get them delivered quickly. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 37 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Digital Federal Credit Union, better known by all of us for so many years now as DCU. And not only is DCU a great place to bank at, but they're also a great place to work and they are hiring for full and part-time positions. I know, it might be a very unique time to be visualizing yourself at a new job. I don't know anyone that's had to do that lately. But at DCU, they're here to help you make the change, along with offering a benefits package that includes three weeks vacation, a competitive salary, a generous bonus program, 401k plan with a 100% company match up to 7%, tuition reimbursement, a student loan payment assistance program, and so much more. Sound good? To learn more about DCU and the career opportunities, visit dcu.org slash careers. DCU is proud to be an equal employment opportunity and affirmative action employer. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by mistresscarry.com which is where you can go for all of the details on the Mistress Carrie podcast and every episode of the podcast, plus every episode of the Situation Report, which gives you all of your headlines in rock, all the details in music, and everything you need to know every weekday in under five minutes. Plus, it's got all of the cocktails in the War Room archived episodes, and there's 118 of them now. But if you're looking for more, I've got more. Photo galleries, my blog, the events calendar that is filled with live streaming concerts from your favorite artists, and the official online Mistress Carrie store where you can get outfitted with all of my new gear. T-shirts, sweatshirts, beanies, shot glasses, pint glasses, mouse pads, koozies, and so much more. And if you're looking to get a hold of me directly... There's even a contact Mistress Carrie button. Just log on to MistressCarrie.com for everything. Okay, this episode was so much fun. I know I've met Lance from From Ashes to New before. They toured with Ice Nine Kills, and I know I've seen him at shows, but we never had a chance to really sit down and talk. And this episode of the podcast gave us that great opportunity. I got to check out his unbelievable collection of anime figurines. We talked about the band's music, including their latest album, Panic, that came out in August of 2020. How much they missed touring. We took a deep dive into the music industry and talked about radio and the philosophy of releasing albums versus singles. We talked about technology and all of the music that inspired that band and so much more. And when we finished the interview, I hit stop on the recorder and he and I just kept talking. And then I realized we were talking about some really cool stuff, so I turned the recorder back on. And you'll hear that towards the end of the episode. We went full nerd when it came to guitar players. People are always asking me about new music to turn them on to. And this episode is a great chance for me to turn you on to some new music. So allow me to introduce you to Lance Dowdle from From Ashes to New. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely, pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only 
Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed. You're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. You're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to... You have the privilege of listening to Mistress Carrie. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Are we working? Are we good, Lance? I think so. You tell me. Yeah, I think we're good. Nice to meet you again. You as well. Like we were just talking about before you recorded, we've met somewhere, sometime. I'm pretty sure I met you at an Ice Nine Kills show, but without going to a concert in almost a year, that feels like a lifetime ago. It's weird. Yeah, back... I guess in my memories, they all kind of run together now. It's hard for me to separate when and where anything ever happened because it's been almost a year and a half. Yeah. When's the last time you guys played a gig? I think the last show was actually March 11th, March 12th, 2020. Yeah, that's right around the time that the world decided we're not allowed to have any fun anymore. Long enough for me to forget everything. (laughs) I joke all the time. The The last show that I went to was uh, the very end of February. I was in Vegas and I saw Bush at the House of Blues. Mm-hmm. And had I known that was going to be the last show that I went to for a year, like I would have done some more shots and like had another beer and enjoyed myself a little more. Oh, for, for a second there, I almost thought that you were going to bash on Bush. No, I love them. <laughs> just no. the way just the way you set it up, I thought, uh-oh, here it comes. No, 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 no. That I, I feel like I would have like sung louder. I would have enjoyed right. it more. I would have savored the, the, the whole experience because I didn't know that was going to be it for the year. Yeah. It's like, okay, you get to go to the show and now you're done. Well, hopefully this teaches everyone, including myself, we can (laughs) take these things for granted. I know. All the people are kind of like, this happens all the time. That's why we we use that one app called Bands in Town. Yeah. Sure, you know it. Sure. But we always try to hammer that into fans on Facebook and wherever, because we'll have this happen where we play a show and no joke, it has happened the next day. Somebody from that city's like, hey, you guys, are you ever going to come to my city? I'm like, we were just there last night. Why don't you keep track with this so you know it's it's just these people that are they're not super into live shows but like at the same time maybe now that this has happened and everyone kind of wants live shows is a little more cognizant of it yeah yeah, these people will want to come out and be be more interactive well i was on the radio at waf in boston for 22 years Mm. and people would always say like why do you play (laughs) bands like guns and roses and led zeppelin and acdc so much and then they'd come into the studio and they would answer the request lines and I would literally finish playing a Guns N' Roses song and the next call would be, can you play some Guns N' Roses? It was the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, hello. At now, what point do you think, like I love all those bands, don't get me yeah. wrong, but like, at what point do you think the generation gap like moves on to something else becoming oldies or you know whatever i think it's already i think it's already happened you know i mean foo fighters is celebrating their 25th anniversary foo fighters so now dave grohl's eligible for induction into the rock and roll hall of fame for the second time that's awesome and he's not even that old in comparison but i think it's i think it's already happening i mean in some ways, I wish I had gotten into radio a little bit sooner mm-hmm. because I heard about some of the stories, obviously, you know, speaking of bands like Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue, like in the late 80s, it was just bedlam. But I started on the air. Well, I started at the radio station in 91. So I was there for that hair band to grunge kind of transition. But when I started on the air, it was 98. So we're talking about Tool. Corn, Limp Biscuit, Deftone, Seven Dust, you know, then getting into Disturbed and Linkin Park. All of those bands I just mentioned almost meet the criteria for classic rock now, which is 25 right. years to the date of its first release. So to answer your question, I think we're already there. I, the random thought just popped in my head because I saw it the other day on my timeline. And it correlates to this 
did you see that there was like a now that's what I call dad rock? Yes. And it's kind of that those <laughs> those yeah. artists. And what cracks uh, me up is like I've become I don't know about you, but during COVID, I became one of those people that never used TikTok to now is addicted to TikTok. Right. Not so much that I'm generating videos, but just I'm in awe at the creativity that comes out of people that are locked in their houses with a cell phone, right? Yeah. And yeah. I love those videos where they have all of these clips of songs and they dare you to like not dance or not sing along to them or to see if you can test your knowledge. And there's all these like new metal compilations. And I'm like, I know the words to ev literally every one of these songs. I feel like that app is a blessing and a curse. A hundred percent. Like you just mentioned the awesome side. There is a lot of creativity. Um, I always hammer down on the bad side thing and like the attention span now of everyone in the world and just like how serious they take this stuff. It, like, is this the way that we need to go or do we keep doing what we're doing? Like it's, it, you see all these comments on um, other radio stations um, when they play stuff from TikTok. I've, I've seen some not so good comments from, I guess, our target audience. You know what I say? Like they're not as receptive. Yeah. But at the same time, do you have to move forward? Like do you have to evolve to this world? Otherwise you'll be left behind. I'm seeing some bands starting to use it as a marketing tool and kind of getting out ahead of it. Mm -hmm. Um you know, it's kind of the video equivalent of Twitter, right? That it right. boils down your entire essence into a minute. And I think it's fun. I I actually prefer the stuff that's not serious. Right. Just the regular people that are just, like, once it starts getting into, like, you can tell they had a $50,000 budget for their TikTok video. It's like, oh, come on. I just want to see people's dog skateboarding and like it just it just makes me laugh because very few things in this world make anyone laugh right now that mm -hmm. everything has become so serious that i just want to be able to go on tiktok and giggle about stupid shit it makes me happy yeah that's we literally just had that conversation today um, about two hours ago i got off the phone with matt because we were like trying to come up with a list of things that we can do to utilize ours now like it's barely just up and running for the most part. That's how mine is. There's a couple of videos of my dog yeah, up there. That's basically right? it. So we're kind of just brainstorming what we want to do business wise. So if you want to like just think music stuff that we can do, but also we just went off the deep end thinking about human psychology and how long these videos need, need to be because people don't like minute long videos. You only got 15 seconds. That's where your market is. Like, what can you do within this amount of time? What kind of funny videos can we do when we all get together in a few weeks? Like, we had a long conversation, but hopefully we're going to have a lot of uh, TikTok content coming up in the next month. Well, the thing is, you know, did, did Fleetwood Mac sit down and brainstorm a guy skateboarding with a bottle of ocean spray? No. I mean, maybe they, the, we don't know. The, maybe they did. <laughs> but like what I'm saying is that I think if you try too hard, you overthink right. it and then you lose mm -hmm. the spontaneity and the beauty of it as well. And it's yeah. like... You know, earlier this year, or actually last year, I started a video show on my Facebook page out of boredom because there was nothing else to do. Right. And I have a room in my house that I call the war room that's been called the war room for 10 years since I bought the house. And it's where the bar is and there's a wood stove in there. And it's got all my military memorabilia from my family and my trips as an embedded journalist in there. So it's just super cool. And so I was like, hey, and I'm going to go live on Facebook tonight. Join me for a cocktail in the war room. Well, it's turned into a video show that's got 117 episodes now, and it's turned into a thing. And I call it my happy accident. So what I'm saying is that sometimes really awesome things happen, not because you sat down and brainstormed and planned the hell out of it, but just because it just kind of happens that way. And I think sometimes that's better. Yeah, that's you know? exactly how it happened for like the very first TikTok we ever posted. Just it was kind of when TikTok started getting like super, super popular. Like yeah. we did, we made an account. I'm just like, you know, our first video, I'm not even going to think about it. I just bought this onesie at the store for my cat. I'm like, all right, <laughs> let's do this. And all of a sudden it's got like 500,000 likes. I'm like, what? 
when did this happen? <laughs> it's so weird. It's so funny the way that some things take off and, you know, and don't you feel that you're, do you just have a cat? Is that you're locked in the house with the cat right now? With four cats, yes. Four cats. Just you. Uh, me and the girlfriend. Okay, I was going to yep. say, like, is there a girlfriend involved? Did you have yep. to get strong-armed into the four cats? But do you find yourself having full-blown conversations with them? Like, I think I'm starting All to go time. loopy with the dog because I've been in the house too much. See, the thing is, we don't think it's loopy. So after all this is over and we're in the real world and we're talking to animals, maybe then they'll think it's a little <laughs> bit crazy. But for now, it's completely normal. Totally normal. I was really excited to talk to you because I've been talking to so many different bands and musicians. And depending on the longevity of career, depending on how many albums, depending on the geographic location of the artist and all the band members, everyone's COVID experience has been different. Mm -hmm. And from what I'm gathering with you being locked in the house with four cats and the girlfriend and talking about how the band's going to get together in a few weeks, you guys have not been able to be together through this whole thing. Is that right? Uh, we did one time. Uh, a couple months ago, that was it, just for a week, just to uh, get some ideas going for things that we can do in the meantime of preparing to be locked down again, which hasn't really happened yet because we don't live in California. But at the same time, we're just kind of preparing for the worst, as, you know, just in case scenario. So we have uh, a few things in the works and then, you know, we haven't been shut down again yet. So just going to be safe about it, but we're getting back together in a few weeks to do some writing for some new songs, go ahead and get the jump start on some new material since we're just kind of sitting around. Why not go ahead and do that? You know, where are uh, all of you guys? Um, kind of like the triangle of Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania. So it's, it's not that much of a pain in the butt to get together, but well, just, some of the bands have been like separated by like countries, countries yeah. mm -hmm. and just it's physically not possible to get through immigration and to be able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. At least you guys, it is possible. Right. So we have no excuse. <laughs> well, other than the global <laughs> pandemic. Right. I mean, there is that. So when when you guys played your last gig and kind of had to come off the road, <laughs> you were already riding some momentum and for a newer, younger band, this experience derails a lot more than it does for a bigger established band mm -hmm. that everybody kind of already knows and is canceling their own tours. But when you're a band that's still trying to get to that level, opening up for bigger bands and all of that stuff, it makes it so much harder to I continue mean, forward momentum with your band. Right. Like we're, we're not lucky by any means, uh, like we still have to really worry about how to save our bank account for when things do pick up and so that we can balance everything and get back to work. We're very mindful of that, but that makes us also think of all the bands that are, you know, even lower, like we're not a big tier band yet. So we think about all the bands below us and like, we really feel bad for them. Like if we're in this position, I wonder how bad they're hurting, what they're going to do to, continue their careers if they can bounce back after all this you know doesn't go away but once we're able to come back can they even come back what are we gonna do like all these thoughts go through our head but it's a really interesting situation because on one hand like what you're talking about it's detrimental to some bands small clubs businesses and on the other hand trying to look at it from you know a glass half full perspective it's forcing creativity in a certain way. It's forcing bands to do things a little differently, to to write remotely, to maybe be inspired by new things. So when you guys are talking about working on new music, is that what you're talking about? Like you guys are finding new ways to get inspired for new stuff? Um, we do the remote thing as well, I'll just get ideas for each other, but uh, we feel that it, we don't get the same energy as we get from actually physically being in a room together, which we also learned that from this panic album, getting to work with some outside people, you know, having their energy in the room as well. And just seeing how, how the magic actually comes together. And, you know, you get that feeling. So 
working remotely, it, it's okay. It's cool. Like we have our base ideas, but once we come together and we present them and we all work on them together, then that's where the magic happens, which is why we feel it's important that we physically all have to be in the room together. I joke all the time about what this pandemic would have been like in the early to mid 90s pre-internet. You know, if you were standing in a hallway with a landline trying to make these phone calls, I mean, it just would have been a completely different, at least we have all these technologies where we're able to connect and, you know, I was able to launch, build a studio and launch my podcast and do all of this other stuff. So thankfully this happened in 2020 and not in 1990. Right. Do you ever wish that it was kind of like the old days though? The old day. I mean, now you're making me feel old, but like, I mean, it's just, it's just different. You know, it's like, uh, it would have forced different things. I mean, I think it definitely would have, it would have inspired things differently. Right. You know, it's like, think about it this way. Every weekend, people that live in Manhattan or people that live near any major city or whatever, they go camping. They don't have to go camping. Mm -hmm. You've got an apartment with the internet and running water and all of those things. And what do they do? They get a tent or a little camper and they go out in the woods to live like you would have lived a hundred years ago. Right. And so I think there's a certain kind of draw to that. Like I forced myself this year to read more books to give myself an excuse to not stare at screens. Right. Like, I don't even want to read on an e-reader. It's like I'm physically reading out of books because just staring at the screens for so long is just driving me crazy. And all the TikToking. All right. How, how's your head feeling? You got you get constant headaches? No, it actually hasn't been bad. And you know what? Like, I find that it helps me sleep if I read before I go to bed. I don't know if that whole theory about the blue light from your screens like disrupts your sleep patterns is true, but I've found that it kind of helps me sleep a little bit. Nice. I don't know. I mean, that's just one of the things that I've been trying to experiment with. Not so much like a New Year's resolution, but I've been doing a lot of self-analysis with my own habits of my life because I'm stuck in the house. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I was just asking that question about the old days. Just, I'm always just curious. Like sometimes I think back to like my childhood, like, man, I, I wish Toys R Us was still around. I wish I was still getting my, my Nintendo power magazines in the mail once a month, like all, all that kind of stuff. Like, if I think about it that way, then I guess, I guess I wouldn't even be here. You know, I wouldn't even be in the band. The band was found because of the internet. You know, there, there's always that, but you always just wonder like, what would happen without everything that we have today? Like, well, that's the thing. It's, it's a really interesting idea of like, you know, I mean, this, this winter we've lost power a couple times, you know, and it's like you lose electricity and you lose your internet and you all of a sudden are back in the dark ages again. And on one hand, you're like, oh, shit. And then you're like, oh, this is quiet and kind of nice. And then the backup generator in my house kicks on and all of a sudden everything's back on. It's like, okay, it's not like it used to be (laughs) because back then I would have been burning candles all night. And Mm. so it's like, I I don't know. I mean, I definitely don't feel as isolated as I probably would. You know, and one of the things that keeps coming up on the podcast is – None of us really have any idea what this is doing to all of us mentally. Little kids, older people. I mean, we know that addiction issues are skyrocketing, that suicides are on the rise. This much isolation is not good for anybody. And I feel like a lot of those things would be even worse, I guess, if we didn't have these digital means of staying connected. So I'm kind of grateful, I guess, that the technology is there. Absolutely. You know? yeah. And it's nice to be able to talk to people and to be able to see them as opposed to just being on the phone. It makes me feel more human. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like, I always get to play, like you were saying, glass half full type of stuff. Do you ever think that maybe it's n- not the greatest thing to have all these connections? Like sometimes like talking to all these people, like seeing all this Facebook stuff, like eventually like, makes you feel more lonely because you can't actually have that right now? Yeah, I mean, that that became a thing when Instagram really hit that people mm-hmm. were showing their best life. 
Mm -hmm. And most of the time it wasn't even their life that they were sharing. And so all of a sudden it made you feel bad about yourself. Um, But that argument's been made, you know, especially for girls, you know, with images of female beauty in magazines and TV. I mean, that's been decades old that it makes you feel bad about yourself, that you're not quite as good as whatever it is that you're seeing. But I think for me, the worst thing about the last year or probably few years is like people are more apt to put the things that they think down in a tangible way, meaning political stuff or whatever, like on Facebook, where you never would have known how racist Uncle Ted was at Thanksgiving. And now that you're friends with him on Facebook, you know what a douchebag Uncle Ted is. And it makes Thanksgiving harder when you're sitting across the table knowing that Uncle Ted is a dick. That's kind of funny. That's actually the topic of something we may end up writing about. Well, you guys write a lot of songs about this kind of stuff and your music when you're talking about self-isolation and kind of all of this stuff. It doesn't surprise me that y- your band would find inspiration in kind of all of the stuff that's going on right now. Yeah, uh, like that particular situation is just like one example because w- we want to take it in a more attitude type of way. Like this past record, Panic, was, um, let's say it, it was heavy lyrically, melodically, and some of the music was really heavy, but it was a lot of sad boy hours going on in our in our brain. Just We never really invited people into our heads to see why the previous albums were the way they were. They were more like underdog, yeah, we can do this, don't give up. We never let people into our own heads to see why we had to do that. So that's what, that's what panic was. And then this record, I mean, with the whole pandemic and us just like seeing all this bullshit on our phones, like you just said about uncle Tom, we're like, Oh my God, fucking uncle Tom. Like we just want to write about uncle Tom. Right. Like, I don't want to be at Thanksgiving with that guy. I I don't want to deal with that guy. Yep. It's, it's just changed a lot of the way that we all kind of see each other. Because in some ways, you're trying really hard to put your best face forward, right? With that unattainable life on Instagram. And on the other hand, you're putting stuff out there that you should never tell anyone because it makes you look like a total asshole. Right. (laughs) And it's like, can't there be some kind of a medium in there where you just show your real self flawed, but not totally an asshole and show the good things, but not Photoshopped to make it look completely sanitized and perfected? It's... It's no, really it's, it's too strange. Difficult for I know. <laughs> I know. It's just like reality TV that it's just not really real anymore either, you know? Yeah. Which is why I love things like podcasting because while it uses a lot of new technology, it goes back to the basic commonality with the human experience which is, which is just sitting down and having just a conversation with someone. Yeah. Yeah, and I love it so much. And having been on the radio for so long, over so many years, I met the most amazing people, the most interesting people that have done the most unbelievable things. But when you're on the radio, you have to condense all of these conversations because you're playing music and there's commercials and there's contests and all of this other stuff. And so, you know, like when... As soon as you and I connected today, I was like, you know, is there a time that I definitely have to let you go by? Like, do you have anything to do that I need to make sure I shut up by a certain time? You're like, no, whatever. And so being able to just sit down and have a conversation and just let it go wherever it goes is incredibly refreshing. And it's so human. That it's just nice. Human? What what is that? I (laughs) know. It's so weird. So one of the things I want to talk to you about with your band, and it kind of goes back a little bit to the bands that we were talking about earlier that are that are just now hitting like the 20-year-old, 25-year-old, is that before that, bands bounced back and forth with inspiration from, you know, here in the United States, there was blues. And then it started turning into rock and roll. And then the European bands were inspired by the American blues artists and recycled rock and roll. And then it came back to the United States and inspired everything. 
this last generation of bands and your generation of band moving forward, they also have this experience of being inspired by a completely different genre of music, Mm -hmm. meaning rap and hip hop, which ironically took its inspiration in a lot of ways from rock and roll in the early days and those rock records they made the samples out of. How do you see this now moving forward to like the next 20 years and what's going to, what other flavor is going to get thrown in there? Because it's rap definitely changed the trajectory of, of rock. I mean, there's no argument there. Right. I mean, how many new artists now have I seen in the past like year? Um, what there, there's Hyra the hero. Um, there's a new one adrenaline. Is that the one that I'm thinking of? I think so. Zero, I think. There's all all kinds of new artists coming forward with a lot of rap influence. Obviously, I mean, we're obvious. You know, that's how, with Linkin Park being around that, that's just how it was. Like you said, generation, that's us, the next generation. Who knows? It's hard to say if if the rap thing is going to last in rock for a little bit because, you know, everything kind of cycles um, what was the big thing? Not, uh, the nineties influence was big, What like five years ago before that was the eighties, everything kind of recycles. So I don't really know where we're headed exactly because at the same time where generations repeat themselves, they also kind of outdo themselves at the same time. Like, um, with lyrics, music, everything, it's not so simple anymore. I think about this all the time, like, man, I wish I was a musician back in the sixties where you just, you just played some easy stuff and you just wrote it. Not saying it's easy. Like there's a lot of color in the lyrics and stuff, but like people nowadays have to push themselves so hard to outdo lyrics, outdo the, the sounds they've been producing. Like we, we always use uh, bring me the horizon as an example of like genius in the sense of like, sound design and stuff like we actually just saw a tiktok earlier that they explained how they put an elephant into their song teardrops so i don't know if you know that song i'm sure you've listened to it maybe yeah but in the, the elephant in the beginning of the song like i actually knew it right away i thought it was either an elephant or like a very squeaky gate closing oh i know what you're talking about yeah but it, it's just that kind of like creative genius that the i love the beatles they never would have had to think of stuff like that but they did yeah. though that's the thing because i'm a huge beatles mm-hmm. nerd and it's like the the beatles had to figure out a way to turn a four track into an eight track mm-hmm. things that we just don't even i mean they they were inventing viral marketing with the paul is dead stuff before viral marketing was even a concept anyone could wrap their head around so you know, on one hand, it doesn't th- it doesn't seem like they had to work as hard, but you also have to put your brain back to remember what the world was like that they were operating in, right. and that they those things hadn't been done before. Right. You know, it, the way that exactly. artists can use Pro Tools now, it's like, well, they had to figure out a way to kind of have Pro Tools before computers were a thing. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like, take that mindset. 20 years from now. Right. But sometimes I also think like, have we peaked out? Like it's not, it can't be possible, but at the same time, sometimes you think that like, okay, we have all these programs. Like how can you take this any further than it's already been taken? You know? But what I love is that artists will then go back and they'll say, you know, an artist like a Lenny Kravitz or a Dave Grohl, they have such respect for the old technology, the tube amplifiers, the analog boards, all of that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, that I think when you get to the point, and I have no musical ability, so I want to preface this, like I grew up in the marching band, but other than that, I, I cannot play any instruments, I can't write songs, but I feel like as soon as you kind of find that wall, then it's like like a ping pong ball, then you have to kind of bounce in another direction. And I love it when people will hit the wall with new technology and then go back and try to infuse older technology back into it again, because you can make anything perfect with a computer, but why make it 
perfect. Like it's rock and roll at the end of the yeah. day. It's not I don't really like perfect. No. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. And it's like when you're live, unless you guys are lip syncing mm -hmm. and playing to a track you're never going to make it as perfect as the record, right. nor do your fans want it to be, right? Exactly. I mean, our fans already know. Our ba uh, we will come out. <laughs> we will come forward. Obviously, we're not playing the keyboard parts live, and we don't have a bass player. That's track, but our vocals, everything that we actually play is 100% real. Yeah. We would never want to fake that. Like, what's the point of even being on stage, really? Like, well, that's the thing. Like, good luck with a live record. It sounds exactly right? like the studio record because you're mm -hmm. just really not and you go back and you look at some of the most prolific live performances in rock and roll or the most amazing live albums and there's just it, there's all kinds of flaws in them quote unquote flaws but that's what makes them cool yeah absolutely you even like remember those flaws too and like sing along with them as they're flawed just it becomes just embedded in your brain like that's how it should be now Right. I love it. Yeah. And it, I mean, there are some instances, you know, where you look at somebody like, uh, I don't like a Peter Frampton or somebody who actually ironically became more famous because their live record was so good, mm -hmm. which, you know, is, is kind of what, a like to be, to become famous as a rock musician because your live performances are so good and not even what you did on a studio album. You don't hear those stories all that often. Right. But we've all had the experience of walking out of a show, having just seen maybe an opening act that you never heard of before, but they were opening for the band you really wanted to see, and you walk out going, holy shit, those guys were great. Right. We're, we're fortunate enough to have... I, I don't ever think of myself highly. I'm a super humble person. So... When fans come up and tell me like, wow, you're like one of the best live bands I've seen. Like I have your records, but like, they, how do, how do we get your like live performance into a record? Cause it just, it's not the same. So it, I, I totally get what you're saying. Like, apparently we're better live than in the studio, even though we, we try our best in the studio, but for some reason it just comes across better live. I don't know why. Well, I think part of it, and, and this is an analysis for me and what I do, like podcast versus live radio, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you know in that moment at the concert that for that 45 minutes, hour, two hours, whatever it is, that everyone is experiencing the same thing at the exact same time, mm -hmm. which in a world where everything is can be pre-recorded and, and everything is a replay or, you know, whatever it is, it's like there is a certain magic to being in that moment. I think it's what all of us miss about live shows. Am I wrong? That like you want to be in the room with those people singing the same lyrics at the same time, smelling the smelly guy at the That's same exactly time. That's exactly what I was going to say. You miss that <laughs> smell. <laughs> But like there is something about it. And I think for the rock community, more so than almost any other genre of music, we celebrate that. That's our mm -hmm. clubhouse. That's our church. That's where we go to kind of be surrounded by the other freaks and the other outcasts. And that in that place, we all belong simultaneously. And you can try really hard to replicate it on a live record but you're always going to have that intangible that's missing mm -hmm. no matter how good your live record is. And there are some unbelievable live records, but you can't tell me kiss alive is better than going to a kiss show. Right. I mean, Absolutely. it's like, you know, and everybody's just sitting around like, when can we go to those concerts again? Cause right. I really miss that. that. That also reminds me like, do you think, let's say the, the pop fandom, like they're probably not hit as hard in that sense. Like they don't miss concerts as much as like we would feel because of like how tight of a bond this audience has together. You know, like the pop audience can kind of get their, their fix off of TikTok and just watching the videos because the artists can just put out content after content. And there's, they're happy. They're just living their lives. They don't really like miss it as much as we do. At least that's kind of how I feel. Well, I think their business model is different. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I can only speak from like the background that I have on the radio side, right? 
pop stations will recycle the same th- song every 75 minutes. And bands and artists get paid royalties for every time their song gets played on the radio. Mm -hmm. So if you're a rock band on a rock station and your song is getting played 30 times a week, 40, that's a, that's a lot. But for a pop artist, your song's getting played a hundred, 150 times a week. They don't need to tour as much because they're making more money off of all of these other spins and streams. And it's just, it, I mean, it doesn't last as long. Right. Like one of the amazing things, like you, you, you know, when we started talking was about these next generation of rock artists. When you, you know, when you're talking about bands like Led Zeppelin and ACDC and Guns N' Roses, some of those records are 50 years old. A, they're still fucking unbelievable. They're still cool. And people still love them 50 years later. There are a lot of pop acts that have come out in those 50 years that have come and gone with one hit song. It's like, for me, if I could be reincarnated into a famous musician, I would so want to be Led Zeppelin as opposed to... Eiffel 65. But just whoever, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, I just... But I think there, I think rock and roll has always just like the blues, like that art form. And I think, I think hip hop and, and rap kind of tied into that vein too, is that it becomes the music of the people. It becomes the soundtrack of the struggle. And that's something that you don't get from pop music. That it's that voice, it's that struggle, it's, it's that common experience that you can relate to. And I mean, I guess country music to a certain extent is kind of like that too, mm-hmm. um, which explains why they have such a rabid fan base as well. Yeah, it's all it's all based in the feeling of unity. Yeah. It, it, honestly, if you just boil it down, to we the all want to belong. Term, yeah, because pop music, most people don't really belong. It's what they want. It's not what they have, which is right. probably why they're listening to it. Yeah, but they don't like really feel anything. Yeah, I just love that. For rock music, like, I remember growing up that if you were a rock or a metal fan, it, like, defined you. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember being such a metalhead that the idea of even liking a band like U2, it was like, no, I'm a metal fan. Like, you can't put that chocolate in my peanut butter. Like, the music you listen to kind of defined you, what you wore. what and, And that part of music has kind of gone away where... I think technology has kind of shown us all that that our musical tastes are a little bit more broad. The concept of like a guilty p- pleasure doesn't really exist anymore because it's like wherever you find the inspiration. And I just think rock fans, I think, are a lot more open minded to that stuff, that it's like they can appreciate artists that are experimenting with different things and that are willing to try things that they're willing to listen to artists that consider themselves a rock band that don't have any rock quote unquote instruments in them, like a Mm. apocalyptica that's cellos or, I mean, they're willing or the who or something where it's just like something completely off the wall, but that's cool. Now, if we can just drill that mindset into the, the small percentage of what it would like to call the gatekeepers of rock and metal, there, there's not a lot, but they make their voice heard. And that, it gets it gets on my nerves quite a bit. I'm sure it gets on your nerves, everyone's nerves. But Well, I mean, it's, you know, I've come from the place, you know, being a music director and an assistant program director at a pretty big rock station that I, I kind of understand it because on one hand, right, you you want to be able to do all of those things. And on the other hand, you're every person that's in whatever business they're in. It does it, not just music, but anything you got to give your customers what they want. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, on one hand, you want to be able to say, look at all this new stuff, check out this crazy invention that look at all this amazing stuff. And on the other hand, if your audience wants this, you can't make them want that. No matter how hard you try. And it's this really weird quandary of like, look, if they want to listen to Guns N' Roses, you're not going to convince them otherwise. If that's what they want. That's why McDonald's doesn't sell tacos. 
Well, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> like, but you know, I talked to somebody that was in that was in the beer business a long time ago, and they were like, you know, Bud Light isn't. I'm gonna misquote them, but the paraphrase of it was like, Bud Light's not anybody's like number one favorite. But it's everybody's number two. So if you go to the bar and you ask for some obscure micro brew or like whatever it is and they don't have it, you know, just give me a Bud Light. Yeah. And it's like sometimes people just want a Bud Light. And so you got to find a way to go, okay, but are you willing to try for a second this other thing that you might really like? You might not like it more, but you can at least, and I think people are a lot more open to that kind of stuff now. I think that's one of the things that the internet has kind of allowed you with streaming, especially that, Mm -hmm. you know, back in the day when you had to buy an album, if you only got four good songs on a record, like you got mad because you paid for the record. And now you kind of have all of these outlets where you can kind of go in and check out a band and see if you like them before you got to make any kind of big commitment. And you just reminded me that's, that's the extra pressure everyone has on themselves nowadays. Like you can't, you can't write that filler record, you know? Yeah. It's, it's dangerous because, um, a lot of record labels they in rock, they still haven't adopted that. I go, okay, let, let's talk like in the pop world, they're kind they kind of got ahead of that they kind of know what's happening so they will have artists only release singles well that's how it used to be in the 50s Mm -hmm. they released a record with an a side and a b side there wasn't Mm -hmm. an lp you went to the store you bought the single the new 45 and it came with another song on the other side of it and Mm -hmm. the whole business was based on that model and then Somewhere in the 60s, it was like, but we could put out a 33 with all these songs on it now. Right. And if you're writing Led Zeppelin 4, that's great. Right. So Okay, so things are kind of repeating in that world. But I guess our rock business side is a little bit behind on that. We've kind of fought to get maybe like an EP's worth of singles and, you know, kind of... I'm going to bring them back up. Bring me the horizon. They did it. Yeah. Dirty Honey did it. Uh, I'm just not familiar enough with Dirty Honey, but that's awesome for them. Yeah. They were, they're an independent artist, no record label, Mm -hmm. released an EP independently and became this huge new kind of rock band that was very reminiscent of a, of a lot of those old school 70s kind of rock and roll sounds. They were one of those bands that, you know, was really making its way and then COVID hit and it kind of, you know, there's so many bands that were literally on the launch pad, you know, and then COVID just kind of, but I've heard a lot of bands like even Evanescence recently, who is a massive band They've been slowly releasing a single or two from a record through the pandemic and the record's okay, there, not even out. Go. So I think like what you and I are talking about, I think the rock industry has been slow, mm-hmm. but I think COVID is slowly coaxing them in that direction out of necessity. Yeah, that makes more sense. I feel like our timing was just more on the unfortunate just beginning side of COVID because that's what we wanted to do. We, yeah. right. Okay. We got this dope record, but like, let's not just overshoot and put it out when we can't tour and all that. Cause you know, people's attention span, they're going to want more and more and more. And we can't give that to them if, if we space it out. But you know, at the end of the day, it, it's how, it, it's how it rolled out, we still rolled out the album, but like eight months later, which was, which was a good thing. Um, our, our timing on that's all right because we're still on single number two. So it still gives us enough time to like start writing, hopefully look forward to touring maybe in the fall, possibly. We don't know, but like uh, I said. Yeah, like, that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing what? that there are going to be some one-off shows and, and some stuff maybe rolling out in the fall, but like giant artist, massive scale tours. Mm-hmm. I'm hearing there's a lot of fear to schedule those this year and that they're getting planned for 2022 because people are afraid to put them out and then have to come back and cancel. Exactly. Yeah. And and if that was the thing, let's say 2022 is now the official date. Like in our case, 
with what we were talking about the slow rollout like our album's been out like how long can we live on this album you know that's why i want i'm hoping that everyone in the rock all the labels get together and really discuss like man we should have been doing this a long time ago now now we're kind of forced to but still it's going to help out our artists if we only do singles we don't make records during this time you know like hopefully our next record we can get away with doing that because sometimes you sometimes you can blow your load if you go record 13 14 songs at once and you don't get a chance to just slowly put it out you know something like this something like covid comes along and says hey hello i'm here to ruin all your plans but now now we have nothing left so hopefully hopefully that's what we can do on this next record is just do uh yeah single after single for a little bit you know it's not it's not only it's like there is no right or wrong way. I think a right. lot of it's going to be artist dependent too. Mm -hmm. You know, I, just seeing, how, especially tied into tied into COVID, uh, people's attention span is also the number one big thing now. Like, you can have all these people come check out your single and then just totally overshoot the rest of your songs, even though you know the rest of the songs are single material, like that's what we're talking about with panic. We sought out, we knew that we we're going to release a record. We weren't going to get our single. So we need to make sure that this record is all, all singles. Obviously not everyone's going to think that, but to us, we want to make sure there's no filler, but like, what good is that? If the people are just looking for that one or two songs, you know? Yeah. And, it, and you can't make them want something they don't. Right. You know? We, so it's like, know. if that's what they want, then give them what they want. Yeah. It's, uh, hopefully everyone catches up on the same page. That's, that's yeah, all we'll I can see. hope for. We'll see. When it comes to working on music, because I know that you guys are doing that and you've referenced Panic and working working with some outside influences on that record, mm -hmm. because I'm not a musician, I'm fascinated by the process when you are an artist or a band and you guys get together and you write some songs that, like what you were talking about, that let people into your own brains to me. And I've said this in interviews with other artists before to me, then working with a producer or working with another artist, I take things way too personally. So if I poured my soul into a song with my best friends mm -hmm. and then this dude walks in the room and tells me to change it, <laughs> I literally would be so crushed. I would never be able to get out of bed. Right. So can you talk about what that's like for you guys working on these songs that are really personal and then allowing outside influences to come in and how that process ends up making the product better? Well, that's uh, that ties into our, our the title of our record. Certainly <laughs> uh, <laughs> making it was not easy as that situation you just described is kind of something that did happen i mean like we we had the basis of all these ideas that we wanted to talk about we knew that we were going to have to expand them with other people this time around which turned out to be a blessing um as just the band as people as any artist let's let's say whoever like an actual artist that draws and paints they have their style it's going to be the same thing all all the time for the most part you can tell that it's that artist you know like for us we know what we want to say and we know like how we t typically tend to color our lyrics what we want to say but sometimes you need to reach for outside help because you've kind of already said the things in the way that you want to say them so you need to look for something new um with that being said you know we come into this record trying to like prove all these points and then <laughs> we we did have the producer kind of look at this like yeah this is trash probably get rid of this get rid of this and when there were some lines that we thought that we worked so hard on that it just wound up going straight into the garbage where it's like oh the feels Ouch. yeah like you i know, can't like, imagine as somebody that's not a musician i can't imagine what that would feel like yeah uh it's it's hard to say like what the producers and motives are behind why it would be trash whether it's like this doesn't work for the current consumer if it's business or if it actually truly is trash either way the producer's job is to be helpful and that's exactly what 
they were on this record. Like it, it, it took us going through those, <laughs> those little ouchies to, to, <laughs> to get through and come up with a good product. Like they had um, an awesome workaround, um, just getting to know them as people and how they, how they work. It, it just made it all easy to become friends and really to shoot the ideas back and forth to see what's good. Be like, nah, man, that's try. Oh, check out this thing. And then like, Oh shit, that was the greatest thing I've ever heard. Like just kind of spitting back and forth at each other. Like, that's how it needs to happen. So we talked earlier, like we need a group in a room to literally just off the top of our head, just say something like, oh shit, uh, that one word you just said sparked an idea in me to do this, this thing. That's just how it works. Like sometimes you can do crazy things like scars that I'm hiding, some lyrics. Those are some pretty deep lyrics. Like we had the idea. All right, guys, let's turn out all the lights and let's fucking just put on some stuff that's going to hurt your brain. Like not torture sounds, but just like terrible stories in the background we're all just kind of laying there listening to people's awful stories like to kind of like help relate to some things that you went through like oh wow then some some people had other lines um other people had different lines we put them all together that's kind of how that song came about it was just like some weird random stuff we're trying out okay we've never laid in the dark before just listening to all this kind of stuff you know like well, Sometimes. it's always interesting for me because I talk to musicians so often how experiences like that can can prompt creativity, whether it be um, the actual location, you know, recording or writing mm -hmm. in a haunted house or, you know, a really famous recording studio like an Abbey Road where you just know generations of amazing creativity have taken place or how you can take a unit, a band, and those same members and put them in different situations. And it does, like, that's why I always love that Foo Fighters record, Sonic Highways. Because to me, I looked at it like a science experiment. That you're taking the same band and you're moving cities and you're putting them in different studios and they're collaborating with different musicians. And... And you can see the end result, which is music from the same band, but it does not sound like every other thing because it had to go through that filter of the location, the other artists, a different producer. Mm -hmm. um, and so I loved that concept of it because it it really was like a science experiment, which you don't think of a rock record ever being, but... It was one of those really kind of strange situations where it was like, okay, we're going to take the same band and make them do a bunch of different stuff. And then you can compare and contrast song to song and be like, oh, you can totally tell that got recorded in Chicago versus, right. you know, so it's interesting to hear what you guys as a band have to put yourselves through to kind of spark some kind of creativity or at least get you all on the same page and mindset. Yeah, nobody wants to. What's the, what's the term? You want know, beating a dead horse. Yeah. Like, you, a lot of bands can kind of get in that situation if they don't seek out, you know, some type of outside help, whether it be writers or producers. So that's it's kind of their job, and you just got to kind of sit back and like check one out and be like, oh, I like this guy's vibe. Let's try to go to him. See what see what he can bring out of us that we can't bring out ourselves. And then you always run that risk where you where you go too far. Yeah. And then the audience is like, what the hell did you do? Like, yeah, you, you got to make sure you have the guy that knows don't change the sound, please. Yeah. This like is this is still love. who we are. Yeah, that's, yeah. I've seen a lot of bands do that and a lot of not so good things happen for them. <laughs> when you were growing up and you went to your first show or you heard your first song, like what was it that made you go? okay, hold on a second, that's that's what I want to do or or hold on, okay, things are different now because I just went to that show or heard this song or do you remember what it was? Um, my situation's a little different because uh, my dad is a well-known sound guy, live sound guy. Um, so like he was Motley Crue sound guy in 86 when my mom was pregnant with me. So he's out on the road with Motley Crue. He's done Ozzy. He's done like Elton John, Usher. There's all kinds of high end. So you didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. And it wasn't <laughs> like music wasn't exactly my thing back then. Like I love music, but not doing music. Like as a kid, that's not, that wasn't my interest. Um, he, he'd buy me, he bought me a drum set once, um, did some piano stuff, you know, going to work with him. 
you know, just hanging out, <laughs> hanging out with the artists, like playing on Elton John's piano on the stage, whatever. Oh like, my God. Obviously taken for granted because I was a kid and I didn't really care. Well, little you know? kids are stupid. They don't understand right? that things like that are as a big deal because to you, yeah. it's just, I'm going to work with dad. So none of that did anything for me. The only thing that, what actually happened was in high school, um, some of my best friends started to form a band together. They didn't know what they were doing either. They just literally bought the kits. The guitarist started learning some stuff. And I went over to the band practice. I don't know, two weeks after they started and they just invited me over just to hang out. And I saw what they were doing. I'm like, wow, this is, this is kind of cool being in this, you know, grungy ass basement, just hearing you guys not be able to play your shit. I don't know how to play it either, but it's really cool. So then I just asked my mom for Christmas. I'm like, Hey, can I, can I get a guitar this year? And then, it all started from there. I got it. I didn't know how to play it. I couldn't even fret the thing. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? So I went from that, eventually just learning it myself, having all kinds of fun with it. And that's really all it took was my best friends just goof around in the basement. I mean, As, that's 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 where great rock and roll comes from. Right. That yeah, story is the same for generations back, is that it, it comes out of a grungy basement. Yeah. So that's why I say like as a kid going to work with dad, working with all these famous people and then go to a grungy basement with your friends. And that's where you really learn to love it. Well, you also <laughs> had to, you know, every kid rebels away from their parents in a way. Right. And so it's like you got exposed to music at the highest level and that's your dad's way. No kid wants to be like, I like everything my dad does. It's like you have to find your own way. Right. And so for you, it's like you had to be with your friends in the grungy basement to be like, mm -hmm. okay, now this is mine and like take ownership of it. Yep. That's the exact same way that I was even noticed in the first place. Like after graduating high school, I went to go work for the company that employed him for all this stuff. So it was a sound company trying to get all the connections and whatnot. And for like a year and a half, like I could just feel like I, I didn't hate my life. I didn't hate my job. It's just like, I just knew in my soul, like, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to help what I want to do. Like, I just want to go back with my friends and write the best songs possible and just make the dream happen. You know? So eventually I just quit. I'm like, I'm going home. This is, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. Then you have to have the same experience that every other person in a band has had, regardless of what their mom and dad do for a living. Right. You have to tell your parents that you want to be a professional musician. And when your dad hears that, he must have just been like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he wasn't going to stop me. You know, luckily I came home and started doing my thing for the next couple of years and then eventually got noticed by a uh, A&R rep from Warner through i don't know we we're playing house of blues or something with the local band and he invited me out to rehearse for this other band that atlantic was putting together called emphatic which i don't know if you remember them back maybe like seven eight years ago they're yeah now called, i think so yeah they're now called through fire oh okay yeah, yeah yeah before that they had a different singer and it was emphatic but i basically was discovered by their atlantic's a r rep he also worked at warren and helped discover lincoln park which is whole side thing but so he invited me out audition got the part in emphatic which eventually led me down the path to getting hooked up with my guys and from ashes to new and here we are if i didn't if i did things dad's way which not a bad way i just i probably wouldn't be here i just had to go through that i gotta go through the grungy basement phase in order to get here you know well i mean everybody's got to find their own way mm -hmm. that's you know you're for as much as, as you can learn from other people's mistakes, there's a certain amount of life that it's like we have to make our own mistakes because that's the only way you can learn. Right. You know, I mean, if that was the case, no one would ever burn their hand because they would have believed the person that said the stove is hot. And yet, right. and yet every person has burned their hand because they were like, you don't know what you're, oh, fuck, that really is hot. Sorry. Okay, I get it. It's like, you know. <laughs> You have to do it. How much fun would it be if we just listened to our parents the whole time? It's like, that's the whole, that's what rock and roll is. It's like that you don't want to listen to anybody else and what they're telling you to do. I mean, that's where the art form comes from and why it still speaks to so many people. Right. You know, Taylor Swift, you know, she's huge and has an amazing audience and whatever, but it's like, it's not quite the same. 
no you like once again you just kind of describe where our head's at in the writing game of how everything is you know at the core of what rock is you know the whole anti-establishment and yeah which is why we're such an amazing community yeah you know which is why i think more so than any other genre um you know, people are really going out of their way to like support their favorite bands in ways and do what they can because it's like, we feel like we're all kind of in this together. And that's why I just love this community as a whole. And it's like, you know, we are all the weirdos or whatever, but we're all in it together. And that's what's cool about it. We don't care if you don't think it's cool. We're here, we know it's cool. So we're, you know, your opinion means nothing. Well said. <laughs> Which is what I love about it. I want to ask you, because one of the one of the fascinating things about being able to do these interviews and being able to see the other person is to see where they're at in their house and the mm-hmm. stuff they have. And I don't know if you did it on purpose to show off what's behind you or no, if that's no, this, just this, accident. But what is going on behind uh, you right now? Th- this is just my this is my Twitch setup. Um I'm in the corner of the room. My girlfriend gets the prime real estate next to me where it's like, <laughs> she's got the fancy camera straight on to the stuff behind you. Um, this, this, we're all giant nerds. We watch a ton of anime. So these are all statues I, I collect. Um, that and the, the, the important piece over there, that all the guitar stuff. Yeah. You know, I, that, I'm a very simple man. I'm, a, I'm just a big nerd. Love this stuff. I'm playing guitar. That, that's it. That's not a bad thing. So what are, what are some of the, cause I, they're small from my vantage point. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the things that are back there? Uh, the, all anime statues like uh, Naruto and Demon Slayer, stuff like that. So if there's, I don't know how many weebs are part of your audience. Oh, but. trust me. There will be plenty. <laughs> okay. Trust me. There will be plenty. That's why I was asking because it mm-hmm. looks really cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool at night. Got it all. I got bought some lighting for it and stuff. So on my Twitch stream, everything's like lit up all, all neat like. Is that some of the things you've been doing while you've been locked in the house with your girlfriend and the cats? Is like making mm-hmm. your because I've been doing that too. Is like you're locked in the house, so you want to make your environment more comfortable, and you're getting right. to some of those things that you never had time to do. Exactly. It's it's both more comfortable and like even doing the Twitch thing, like it's a way to kill some time. But then at the same time, after a couple months, you're like, why am I doing this? I should be putting all my effort into this. And like my brain's all over the place. So like I do enjoy Twitch doing my thing, but like I'm back in the mode of like, all right, I gotta get back to work. What's serious? Like writing new songs and whatnot. But... So what, um, when the band gets back together in a couple of weeks, are you guys going into a studio or are you going to go to somebody's house or how is this going to work for you guys? Oh, we usually we'll, we'll go to uh, rapper Matt's house, kind of just lock ourselves in the basement there, and back um, to the basement. It back, it's always in the basement. Yeah, it's why. good. Um, but yeah, he he's got his setup. I've got mine. We're all kind of between me, him, and Danny. Like we have our uh, workspace all set up, so all of us can be producing demos at the same time. So like. I can have uh, Maddie's drums all hooked up to my setup. He's got other stuff hooked up to his setup, like a lot of synth sounds. So like we can write in real time, record the parts in real time. And just, it helps us flow through ideas a lot faster. Like we did it all on one person's computer. We just got to build everything separately, come up with stuff like this way. We can still be a real band, but we're also you know, recording the demo product in a way that people would only do it based on one computer as opposed to three different computers. I don't know if any of that makes sense to you. We no, kind of just. Yeah, I, I get it because you're. There's so much electronics that's involved mm-hmm. where some bands there isn't. And so if you're going to start folding all of these electronic layers in there, you've got to have a way that you can record it in the way that you want it to sound. And so you've got to have multiple computers going and you got to kind of have a space to be able to make all of that work. Yeah. It, it's easy. Like if it was just one guy, like you could sit back and work on one little synth track the whole day, like, Oh, try this, try this. Whereas like, if you got three people hooked up and you can jam to it, like, you know, it works cause we're all jamming to it. You don't have to sit there all day before we do all this other stuff. It just workflow streamline, all that good stuff. 
And it's got to be something that this is the longest you guys have been apart in how long? I mean, you yeah. Besides, usually... besides that short little vacation, we'll call it right. Where we saw him a few weeks ago. Yeah, it's, it's been a long time. And and for a band, it doesn't matter how big the band. It doesn't matter like the lifestyle of a rock band more so than some of the other genres that we were talking about. Is that you're a road dog? You're just gone mm-hmm. all the time. You're touring, and so to be home and stagnant, it's a universal experience that all rock bands are going through where it's like i'm a caged animal right now (laughs) yes (laughs) every day on facebook there's a new person that i know from this world like oh god you don't believe how bad i miss playing shows like it's just a new person every day we all feel the same thing we're typing the same sentences (laughs) yeah so besides besides the anime and the Twitch stuff. Like, has there something, has there been a new discovery for you, a new hobby, a new show or anything that because of COVID that you've discovered something that you like now that you never in a million years would have liked before? Um, Both of us enjoy cooking now, I guess playing pretend fancy chefs maybe (laughs) well that's that's the kind of stuff i'm talking about like so so are you watching the food channel are you going online and looking up recipes and what are you cooking because i love to cook too honestly i i i rely all of my information on the other half smart man and it's mostly coming from like tiktok honestly there's all these channels just come up like she just showed me this account of some lady making the most fancy of salads within like 30 seconds. I'm like, we got to try this one, this one, this one. And just, <laughs> that That's where it comes from. And then we try out all this stuff. And that's how we kind of kill time trying something new. Usually we would just, you know, make mac and cheese or something. Not healthy, but I mean, we do work out and whatnot. But as far as food goes, we were never like big into cooking until like the past few months. And being a touring musician... It's not exactly unless you're at like a Taylor Swift level with a private chef and whatever, being on the road and touring, it's not exactly the best food most of the time. Oh, no. I I know how to survive off of (laughs) (laughs) Pop-Tarts. So when it comes to um, being home and cooking and you're at home in your own kitchen making dishes because you've done a lot of traveling as a musician. One of the things that I always ask people is where have you been outside of where you grew up, whether it be another country, another part of the country that you had a chance to kind of go look around and travel to that. You're like, okay, this is awesome because when we're all finally allowed to get the hell out of the house, people are going to want to go on vacation. Mm Mm-hmm. So where would you suggest? Where have you been that you absolutely oh, that's loved? That's easy. That, that correlates exactly to all the stuff behind me. Like we we uh, we did a week long thing in Tokyo um, a few years back. So, I mean, obviously, I love the culture there. I love the food even more. Um, that, that's kind of like where we a lot of our recipes are all Asian inspired food dishes. Um, so yeah, I would suggest Tokyo. That's my favorite place in the whole world, and plus. It's not Tokyo, but somewhere else in Japan, they just released uh, Super Mario Nintendo World at uh, their Universal. Oh, my God. So it's like walking straight into a giant Mario game. It's awesome. <laughs> I need to go there. I think it opens <laughs> up It opens up in February or March, I believe. So once you can travel again safely. See, now I want to go to the up. Star Wars one for the same right? reason, because mm-hmm. it's like having grown up in that kind of universe. It's like I want to walk through star wars in real life like i i need to see that i haven't even been to harry potter world yet neither have i the last time i went to is it universal i don't think it was open so i didn't get to go i went to the simpsons world that was interesting i have never been there either that was pretty cool just because i mean you know you just grow up watching Mm -hmm. the simpsons who we've all learned have basically predicted everything that's going to happen in the future right it's like it, the Simpsons have already decided the future. It's just we just haven't caught on to the fact that they're psychics. It's kind of scary. They are our Mayan calendar. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
Well, I really appreciate you being so generous with your time. It was so nice to actually meet you for real. Like I said, I think we met once like in passing and it was just really quick backstage. And, um, you know, so to be able to sit down and have a conversation about the band and kind of how this is affecting you guys and, and moving forward. And I just look so forward to being able to meet you in person and to hear this music that you guys are going to be working on. Like, I just can't wait for what's coming. Well, I, I really hope that by the time I actually see you again, it's not like I'm with my walker. I'm like, <laughs> I think I've seen you somewhere before. Wait, do I know? Wait, let me get my glasses. I can't. <laughs> Who are you? I know it's, but I have to just think about it. And, and as a rock fan, I'm so excited about all of the amazing music that I know is coming. It's like everybody right now is a pregnant friend. There's going to be this amazing baby boom in 2021. Right. And that I know there's all this awesome music coming too. So at least we have that to look forward to. I, I guess you really could consider all the rock bands this year as pregnant moms. Seriously. So hurry up and give yeah. birth already, will you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the episode was supposed to end. Talking about pregnant moms. And I hit stop on the recorder. And then he and I just kept talking. And then we started talking about guitar players. And then I had to turn the recorder back on. Hold on a second. I was trying to say goodbye to you. And you dropped the name Nuno Betancourt as being one of your favorite guitar players. Absolutely. And now there's no friggin' way that I can end this interview without you talking about not only Nuno, but the guitar players that have inspired you. Because knowing the band that you are and the music... like. I would never have imagined that Nuno was going to be the first name that came oh, out of your yeah. mouth. Oh, yeah. That's why I love, like, people do not know what to expect out of me being a, well, I guess you'd consider me a new metal player, maybe? Something like, like you well, don't Well, you're really, a new, new metal player, because technically new, new, metal new metal was, like, yeah, late right? 90s. Right? I'm the new, new. Um, yeah. But, yeah, they don't, people don't typically correlate that with, you know, hair metal and shreddy well, there was a time, like, I remember the 80s, right? I was young, but I but I was there. And then in the 90s, it became cool to trash on the 80s. Mm -hmm. And that, it, it, that you got made fun of if you found any love for that 80s music. And then eventually, people started to realize that not all the 80s music was terrible. That there was right. a lot of great, amazing stuff that came out. Absolutely. And it wasn't just all about Aquanet and, se you know, and sequins <laughs> and spandex. Like there was a lot of great stuff. And like we were talking about earlier, that these cycles go through. So when you and I were saying goodbye to each other, when, when Nuno's name came up, I was like, wait, shut up. <laughs> so Yeah, that, that whole world to me is that that's really what got me to the level where I'm at. Like uh, Nuno, obviously Van Halen right up there they're both number ones to me paul gilbert all three of them are like my number one of the that whole time frame like i love them so much i would never be the guitar player that i am today if i wasn't you know learning their craft i mean it's interesting when i talk to nuno that when i talk about eddie van halen i call him eddie van halen mm -hmm. when nuno talks about him he calls him edward mm-hmm and I just know it's out of a respect thing because Nuno holds him in such high regard. And I never even thought about it, but I picked up on it when he and I were talking because he was like, well, it all begins and ends with Edward for me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Nuno calls Eddie Van Halen Edward. And I'm like, so that just level of respect, you know. And then Mike Mangini told me a story about how Eddie Van Halen was complimenting Nuno's playing to him when Nuno wasn't in the room and it's like, so when you get all these guitar <laughs> players that hold each other in such high regard to be so complimentary to each other. And you're talking about how these are the guys that inspired you to play in mm -hmm. the first place. Yeah. I mean like today's generation of like crazy guitar players are a little bit different for me. I, I've kind of like, no, I've not given up on that world. It's, it's not the same as it was, but I'm more into songwriting nowadays, but like as a, as guitar craft goes, that was the height for me, was that era. Well, and it, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier when it comes to breaking new ground, right? Mm -hmm. With technology. I mean, 
Eddie Van Halen changed the game and changed how guitars got built because guitars didn't do what he wanted them to do. So right? he made one that did. Yeah. <laughs> So Absolutely. it's like, you know, you got to change it in some way. I mean, you know, would Jimi Hendrix have sounded the way that he did if he played the guitar right side up? But that's just how he learned, so that's just what he did, and it just totally changed the game. Yeah. I'm so, not sure what, I guess, a modern version of that maybe would be Muse. I, I know oh, that they, yeah. they've done some crazy stuff with their guitars and whatnot, putting like synthesizers inside the guitar and like some weird pads and stuff, really cool stuff. Well, there's a guy like Tom Morello that was uh, like, wait, yep. I'm going to pull the plug yep. out of my guitar and just drag it down the strings mm -hmm. and see what happens. I mean, there are always those visionaries that that look at it in a completely alien way. Yes. Like everyone else looks at the guitar and sees the guitar the way that it is there are certain people that look at it and see it as the way that it could be. Yes. I, I, I think today's generation is so math based. If we want to even call it that, like just create, like we got to have the craziest number of strings on a guitar and just like tap in a certain pad. It's all math based. That's why I personally enjoyed where I came from, where everything was based on feel like Van, Van Halen. You can try to copy them. You're not going to sound like them. Like we, Honestly, we did a cover of Beat It. We never released it when we were doing all our covers. That was the last one we did. Um, it was after he died. Um, so we were like, all right, um, let's 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 try let's try a cover of Beat It. I think you guys will sound great on it. I'm gonna try my best to honor him and guitar playing, but like it sounds close, but it's no one can sound like him. You can try all you want. Well, Nuno told me a story on the podcast. For anybody that's listening that didn't hear it, go back and listen to the Nuno episode. He went to the studio where Van Halen was practicing and Eddie gave him his guitar that was plugged in with his cable that was hooked up to his pedals that was running through his amp. Yep. And Nuno played it and was so mad <laughs> that he still sounded like Nuno. He was like, it was the one opportunity in the world for me to play like Eddie Van Halen and I still sounded like myself and it was so upsetting <laughs> because there's only one Eddie Van Halen. Yep. Only he can sound like that no matter how much of his gear you're playing through. It just doesn't exactly. matter. Yeah, everyone's got their signature thing. You, you, like, you know when has Zach Wilde playing. Nobody else really oh, has. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> no one has that sound. Yeah, absolutely. And he's one of those guys that, sat, like, it sounds like he was born to just play the guitar. Mm -hmm. like, like, he, like, he was probably born with it already in his hands. Because even when he's just sitting around, it's like he would come into the studio and come on my show and he would plug a guitar in and I would just put the fader up while we were talking because he would just noodle because his fingers just had to be playing all right. the time. And then people would text into the studio and be like, stop talking. I want to hear what he's playing. <laughs> and then I would stop talking and then he would stop playing because he's like, I'm just screwing around. I'm not even playing anything good. And I'm like, no, no, no. We're all sitting here just listening to you play nothing. Because it's awesome. Oh, yeah. I so. still watch all both Zach Van Halen. I watch videos from like back in the 80s. Like, uh, heck, I don't even know how many views it has. But like the main solo video of Zach with Ozzy back in, oh, I can't remember the year. But I, I watch that a good like three times a year to get more inspired to keep playing and whatnot. Well, imagine you're an 18 year old <laughs> kid and yep. Ozzy says, Hey, I want you to be my new guitar player. P.S. You're filling the shoes of Randy Rhodes. Mm -hmm. I mean, what? Yep. How does that even happen? I don't know. It's, and he did it. And he, did I it. know. He, yeah, he did it. And he was, he was so young. How young he really was 18. Yes. That is or crazy. 19. Yeah, but he Absolutely wasn't old crazy. enough to drink. Not that it mattered being on tour with Ozzy, but like right. he was a kid. Oh, that's insane. No pressure. Right? No pressure I, at all. Uh, the, the, you're still just reminding me like why today's music is the way that like I don't I hope guitar can kind of get back to that. Like and I'm guilty of it, too. I'm just stuck in like the songwriting avenue because that's where I feel I need to be because guitar playing isn't quite 
as relevant, but we do have people making it relevant again. Like we were just talking about Jones. A. Ron oh, Jones. Oh, A. Ron Jones. He's yeah. amazing. He was on yeah. the podcast too. And it's like, he's got his own vibe and his own sound. That's, like, yeah, that's awesome. The, who was it that said that all you need is three chords and the truth? Who was it that said that? I don't know, but I like that quote. Yeah. It's a very famous quote. It's definitely not mine, but that will never not be cool. Mm-hmm. Three chords and the truth. It will just never not be cool. I'm going to get comments on this episode of the podcast with people telling me who that quote should be attributed to. And I apologize yes, uh, for not knowing it and hey, for paraphrasing the quote. But it, hey, I don't know it either. True. And I want to know. So I hope I get to read this. Comment. I'm sure somebody <laughs> yeah. will figure it out. But yeah, it, it's totally true. At the end of the day, mm-hmm. rock and roll, I think, will always boil it back down to that essence. And, you know, that's why I was so excited. I'm like, hold on a second. When you start throwing around names like like Nuno as guitar influences and stuff, I had to hit record back again. So I appreciate you humoring me for 10 more minutes yes. so that we could put that guitar discussion on the end of the episode. All right. Okay, now the episode can end for real. Lance Dowdle was so awesome. And if you want to get a look at his Twitch, all of the links for him and from Ashes to New are in the show notes of this podcast as is the custom playlist for episode 37. For every episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast, I put a playlist together of all the music we talked about. And this playlist is epic. There is so much music in it. Huge thanks once again to Digital Federal Credit Union at dcu.org and mistresscarrie.com for sponsoring this week's episode. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss anything with the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday. Plus, every Monday through Friday, you get the sit rep. The Situation Report is all of your rock news, music headlines, and industry info in less than five minutes. Who doesn't have five extra minutes? And if you don't mind, leave a five-star review and a comment. And don't forget, every Tuesday night at 8.30, join me live on my Facebook page for Cocktails in the War Room. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network.